Hello, welcome to Bedroom Builds at the From Python to Rust series, episode 40, Rust style Python code, coming from the previous episode where we spoke about Fultic. The idea behind Rust style Python code is that we can apply the insights and knowledge gained from learning Rust onto our Python code, and that can be kind of useful. A friend of mine approached me and asked me, like in, in their company, they have a huge Python code base. They will not rewrite everything in Rust, and it will also be hard to convert every programmer to, over to the Rust programming language. Therefore, I was looking for a way to at least improve or change the way that they program Python. And what I'm trying to offer in this episode is some ideas of what to look at. That doesn't mean that all of these things are intelligent solutions that you should do. These are just food for thought and you can look into them and figure out yourself if this, if this can be applied to your project or your programming. So the first big thing that would be different between Rust and Python are traits. And Python allows you to use normal object-oriented inheritance. And using this object-oriented inheritance model cannot be directly applied to Rust. However, with uh, certain tricks in Python, you can actually create something similar to traits with uh, higher order mixing classes that you can write yourself or with uh, this uh, Python 3 traits library that exists. I will show you an example of a higher order class. You should uh, read up on the Py3 traits uh, module, how it is intended to be used and how this will give you the composition that uh, traits allow you to do. Reasons why you want to look into traits could be simply to avoid the diamond problem and other hard issues that come up with multiple inheritance. Okay, let's hop in to the higher order mixing class example and this should give you an idea of how you could think about using the dynamic programming features that Python provides you to implement something like a trait. So on the left, this time we are only speaking about Python, so we'll have the Python code on the left, and on the right we have the terminal where you can run the Python code. What we will create here is this has color trait, if you will. So what this is, is a function that will return, as you can see here, the inner class. This will return a virtual class that is generated at runtime and this you can then, which you will see later, use to derive your other classes from. The idea is we provide a property with a name, a default value and a documentation string. So what we are doing is we're creating the property name, we are setting up uh, colors in our case so we can map human readable colors to their respective x values. Then we define a getter and a setter for it. Of course we handle the errors if something is unknown or not within a known range of values. And down here we create the class that we want to extend with the properties that we want to provide to the derived classes using the set atter for the inner. And once we have that, we can return it. What Python allows us now is to hop down in the code and uh, define, for example, a canvas. And the canvas has a foreground color and a background color. And in order to avoid the code repetition, by having to set up those properties for canvas and the button, we can simply derive the button to have all the properties of a canvas since it will be drawn onto a canvas and has additionally a border color and a text color. So the button now will have a foreground color, background color, border and text color and we can see this will work. Because we create a canvas, we give it a foreground, we create a button with foreground and text color, and then we print out the canvas's foreground color and the button's text color 
and the buttons foreground color. Let's quickly run uh, the code. So here you can see that the canvas foreground is red, which is red. The button text is uh, green, green, and just the foreground gets the value zero. So all color zero denote the color black. So all of this was correctly done. This is a neat trick to avoid repetition of code and to kind of emulate what the traits are doing in Rust. This is probably not a clever usage for objects that are instantiated within loops, for example, or other high performance code, but to have a nice code base looking like this can be uh, advantageous. Let's go over to the next point. So here we will have the big difference between uh, Python, a dynamically typed language, and Rust, which is uh, statically typed. In Python, you don't have to define the types of arguments to functions, for example, or the return type of a function. In Rust, you have to. Now that is a habit that you can actually pick up and that will be very advantageous for your code. And there is the MyPy project that will do the checking for you at runtime. The whole type hinting and type checking becomes way more comfortable when using Python 3.9 and higher because there you do not have to import from the typing module when you want to define a list or a dict type, for example. In general, this will help you avoid bugs while running the code because passing wrong or unexpected data types to your functions will immediately be flagged either by running it through MyPy at the runtime or oftentimes it will already be enough for your linter to tell you that what you are passing as an argument is of the wrong type. One of the linters that supports this highlighting, for example, would be PyWrite. And this one can be installed to any editor that supports the language server protocol. Another advantage of uh, using type hints and kind of enforcing them in your code base, every programmer will now have to think about what is the desired input and what is the desired output. This then often leads to much nicer APIs for your code base. Let's quickly look at an example for uh, type hinting. Looking at the code for type hinting, you can see that we import from the typing module the type iterator because what we are doing first is we are creating a Fibonacci series and in order to do that we will have to use or pass in the number n which is of type integer and it returns an iterator of type int. So this function is an iterator because it uses the yield statement and here we do the math to find the Fibonacci series. Using the function down low here in the code would mean that if we passed a string here, for example, instead of the integer 10 or a float, the MyPy would react to it or your linter will highlight it immediately. Same is true if this is the dynamic code, for example, a parsed number coming from the arguments, you will immediately see when there's a float coming in, or a boolean, for example. The same can be applied, of course, to the methods within a class. So here we have the initial balance being an integer, and it returns none. And you do not have to type hint everything. The MyPy allows you to avoid this, and this would be also very redundant, because every self will be of type bank account. That doesn't make sense to add this extra sugar to every code line. Here we have a return type of a bool instead of none. And here we are calling it with an initial amount and we withdraw but a float. And uh, let's see what happens if uh, we do that. If we run the code normally through Python, then what we will see is it will happily output the list of our Fibonacci series and then it will give us a float for our bank accounts withdrawal amount because I passed a float in here. 
if I however run this now with uh, MyPy, then it will immediately tell us that the withdraw arguments number one are supposed to be integer and I passed a float and therefore this will be an error and this will uh, drastically improve your code if you stick to those type hints and you actually at least on the testing system run your code with mypy let's change the code to use an integer and see what happens first we run the mypy again now it's all fine and you're running the normal python will now also give us an integer and not a float as the return value going to the next uh, thing this is not yet available unless you are running the current uh, release candidate of Python 3.10 is a structural pattern matching. This is something that the Rust compiler already supports and in my opinion uh, greatly improves source code. In the Python proposal there is a great tutorial online how to use the structural pattern matching. One of the cool things in Rust for structural pattern matching is if you match against an enum it will do exhaustiveness uh, checks for you. So if you have not implemented every variant of the enum in your match statement, it will let you know. And with this, you can avoid forgetting to implement certain variants and therefore have a much more stable code base. Because if another programmer adds, for example, a new element to the enum or removes one, then the rest of the code will no longer compile unless you have implemented the new variant or removed it from your match statement. This exhaustiveness check will also be available for enums in Python. This is a great way to make sure that your programmer colleagues are not forgetting something, even though they haven't really written the base code in the first place, but with this match statement, for example, they will be forced to deal with all the variants. Now let's look uh, quickly at an example of structural pattern matching in uh, Python. So what we have on uh, the left is, of course, the requirement that we run in Python 3.10, otherwise this will not work. Here we have a command that can uh, be passed via string for a game, for example. So what the character will do once uh, this text has been typed is it will drop the key, the sword and a coin. In order to implement that, we will have to create a character that can uh, drop stuff. And we also want to know where it was dropped. So we can uh, drop, for example, the key into, and then, I don't know, the bedroom. The character can also pick up things. So what we can do now is actually pseudo parse <laughs> this command. All we have to do is use uh, the split string. This way we get all the separate elements as an array and we can match against that but we do not know the final number of objects so I can only type drop key and it would be one object but it can also be three like in this case or more so we can handle these cases we'll have the case drop and then the objects then we can loop over the objects and have the character drop all the objects the same is for the pickup command. If we parse the pickup first, then the objects would be picked up. Now, let's run this Python code. This shows you that it works. What you can also do is add a default. If you now add this code, we can see that if I change the command to Bob, then the pattern matching will tell me unknown. However, the problem is if I now were to change the pattern matching to another command, like a test, for example, I would still leave this uh, Bob keyword. Now there is no error happening whatsoever. This is important to know that in uh, the case of a Python, a non-successful match will simply not raise an exception or any problem, it will simply be ignored. That concludes uh, pattern matching, so I hope you get to use Python 3.10 once it's out at uh, your company. This will greatly improve your code and it allows uh, a lot more 
to be done. I invite you to read the documentation that is already out there. The examples are amazing. And of course, in the future, when you want to move over from Python to Rust, you will have an easier time because Rust already supports structural pattern matching. Next uh, thing we can talk about are exceptions. They do not exist in Rust. And this is probably not a good idea to now adapt the usage of the error handling that was created for the Rust programming language into uh, Python, because Python is built all around the exceptions and they work very well with one exception that is within asynchronous uh, programming. Exceptions are sometimes not 100% clear where they are actually coming from. So for async uh, functions, you may choose to return values and make sure that they do not throw exceptions. And then you can let bubble up the errors or results in the same way that Rust does. So potentially you could think about wrapping the, every result in a result class type that either holds a result or an error. And then you create your own error handling, maybe using the structural pattern matching already. This way you will know which function caused the error within your asynchronous executor. Yet another big difference is memory management. You do not really have control over memory management in Python because it uses a garbage collector. However, coding in Rust makes you more aware of the scope of a variable and therefore its construction and uh, destruction often. And uh, this you can, of course, uh, also apply to your Python code where you are more conscious of the scope of your variable variable within your Python code and you can help the garbage collector by keeping the scope of your variables only small or if you know that there's no other code accessing your large chunk of memory afterwards you can use the del statement to let the garbage collector know that this is unreferenced as of now. One option that um, Python gives you, you can use the gc module and call uh, gc.collect. This will then run the garbage collector at this point in the code where you have called the gc collect. Plus with this uh, gc module, you can uh, tune how the garbage collector actually works. You can even disable it. It is however advised against uh, using those fine tuning options of the garbage collector because it is actually working very, very well. There are only very rare corner cases where you want to use those uh, tuning options or manually call your GC collect. Long story short, Python provides us limited memory management capabilities and given correct scoping of the variables, normally we can actually avoid memory bloat while our application is running. Another thing to consider is using the async await programming pattern. If you do that already in your Python code, you will have a much easier time transitioning over to a programming language like Rust that also supports the very same async await programming pattern. But oftentimes you can replace uh, threading code with this uh, pattern that allows for you to write the code in a way where it looks like synchronous code, but it is actually executed in concurrent fashion. Downside of it is you basically infect your code base. If you want to run async code, now all functions and all methods would have to be async or at least async uh, compatible, i.e. this means you are not supposed to have any code that will block the main thread because if you do, you will actually keep all the other tasks from running. Thanks for watching. Coming up next on the From Python to Rust series, I don't uh, really know. I've ran out of topics. If you want to see something specific that you're interested in that would uh, go from Python over to Rust, please let me know down in the comments. The next episodes I will code a uh, YouTube uploading software in Rust. So this will be now pure Rust code only, but showing how I go about writing it and which uh, crates I use. I hope this will also be informative and helping you guys learn the programming language Rust.